So the conventional way of doing your uh, title slide is you have the title of the talk and then you have the author. Um, but in this specific case, it's kind of awkward because I didn't want there to seem like there was a question and a response. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the title, and this just happens to be the person who's giving the talk. <laughs> so these days, a lot of people are talking about beautiful code. And some will say, oh, yeah, because of code beauty, and we all nod, like we know what they're talking about. Um, but no one's really talking about what that means. So um, I spent some time reading through the sort of classical literature on beauty to get a sense of what beauty is meant and see how that might relate to code. So of course, where most people start is with the Greeks. and. I think when most people think about beauty, if I said to you, like, what's beautiful? You would think of maybe a baby, or you would think of a woman or a flower. Uh, but that's very much all tied up in appearances. And the first kind of point to be made that I learned was that even though when we think about beauty, the first thing that we usually think about is the appearance of things, the appearance of things isn't really beauty itself. Right, that there's a deeper idea here that appearances only present to you. They are the gateway to these sort of deeper ideas of what beauty actually is. Plato had this very kind of curmudgeon attitude about beauty. So he said, the ability to grasp mere appearances cannot lead to adequate understanding. Right. So in, in Greek culture, a lot of people would think of beauty in terms of the way things looked, and he thought that was superficial. The other idea is, at its worst, the appreciation of beauty can mire us in the world of sense experience. Right? But at its best, it can lead to the understanding of goodness. So we have this correlation here between goodness and beauty. Right? These kinds of ideas are echoed much later by Rousseau. And, uh, the idea of goodness and beauty is correlated again. He says, I've always believed that good is none other than beauty and action. And both have a common source in well-ordered nature. Right. So, so there's a deeper logic here. There's a deeper kind of system of, of how beauty works uh, being presented to us. So this idea of a well-ordered nature. Well-ordered nature comes into play again. We have Pythagoras who you might remember from middle school when you were playing with triangles. Um, but Pythagoras actually ended up having this whole kind of religion and all these followers. And he's famous now for the Pythagorean theorem. Um, but the sort of main thrust of his philosophy is that there's beauty out of numbers, because everything is built from numbers. They're the source of everything. Um, so all things exist because they are ordered, and they are ordered because they are the realization of mathematical laws. Right. Um, there's a famous anecdote about the, the way that Pythagoras is sort of arriving at these ideas about mathematics and numbers and how they're the center of everything. He was walking through town, and there was a blacksmith beating on an anvil. And he was listening to these sounds, and he found them harmonious. And he found them beautiful. And, and it was curious to him why he was getting that response. So he went up to the blacksmith, and he was inspecting his tools. And he noticed that the various hammers had different proportions, different sizes. So one would be this big, and the other one was half the size. Um, and so he was recognizing a sort of fixed proportional relationship between the size of the hammer and the sound that it would make. Um, and that led him to do all these experiments. Here we see some old people playing with some bells and playing with water in a cup, and there's numbers. Uh, but it actually ends up being the basis of all kinds of music theory, the relationship that defines intervals. Um, and they took that very same knowledge 
and use those exact same relationships to build their temples. So the space between the columns and the relationship between things in the facade of the building uh, are using those exact same ratios that were discovered in sound itself, right? So we have this whole religion around numbers, and, and um, that's the way that they see the universe being built out of numbers. Um, so that's not really what I think is useful for software, right? Those are kind of interesting ideas to realize that if we think about beauty and we relate it to ideas of numbers and ratios and all this kind of stuff, that there's a deeper logic than just the fact that when I look at her, I feel something in my tummy, right? There's reasons for that, probably, right? So I think an interesting idea that comes up um, is in the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas starts collecting all these theories from the Greeks about what's beautiful, and he presents three rules for what he thinks makes things beautiful. So the first rule is the idea of proportion, which we've already sort of looked at in the architecture. So if you look at my hand here, each knuckle is proportionate to one another. Each finger is proportionate to the other fingers. The set of fingers are proportionate to the hand, right? If my fingers were this long, twice as big, that would, wouldn't be very good. If they were half as long, that's not very good either. The hand is also proportional to the wrist, which is proportional to the forearm, and the forearm is proportional to the arm in whole, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's a reason, right? Because if my fingers were twice as long, my hand wouldn't be good at grabbing things and doing stuff with things, manipulating objects. So the idea of proportion is directly related to the, the purpose that that thing is used for, right? Um, so you want to have things be the appropriate size relative to one another and have the appropriate number of those things. If I had two arms, maybe it would become useful for some scenario, but I think right now it would mostly just be in the way. If I had 15 fingers, that would just kind of be in the way, right? So it's the idea of proportion you can think about. The other idea is integrity. And the kind of metaphor here is if I had a hammer made of crystal, you might look at that hammer and go, that's a really beautiful material. That's a beautiful hammer. But then when you go to actually try to nail something in, it's going to explode and shatter because it really sucks at being a hammer, despite being beautiful. And this is where ideas of beauty can deceive you, right? You can look at something and through its appearance it can seem beauty, but it doesn't have integrity. So Aquinas thought that things that were missing something or didn't have what they needed were ugly. Um, so the other idea is not only do you have to have things in the right proportion or relationship one to one another, but they also have to be able to do the job that they're intended to do. They need to be able to do it well. And so that's the idea of integrity. And then the last idea is claritas, which for Aquinas was actually sort of divine because it had to do with luminosity and God and all this kind of stuff. But um, Clarity also in the sense of simplicity, of something that's clear. Something that's unclear isn't beautiful, right? So why does any of this stuff matter, right? If we try to think about how this relates to software, um, if any of you have read like Ken Beck's book, Small Talk, Best Practice Patterns, or if you've read Martin Fowler's book on refactoring, or if you've read Eric Evans' book on domain-driven design, there's all kinds, of, all kinds of ideas that they're presenting. Um, and if you sort of scrutinize uh, the language and think about them in terms of those three ideas of beauty, of proportion, integrity, and clarity, um, 
there ends up being a, excuse me, there ends up being tons of overlap. So it's kind of interesting because, you know, Ken Beck was working on small talk stuff in the 80s. And uh, he was trying to solve problems, and he was running up against uh, better and worse ways of doing things. He would try something, it wouldn't be a good idea. He would try something else, that idea would stick. And after a certain amount of time, he had tried enough things and arrived at enough things that worked in a way that he liked that he could write a book like Small Talk Best Practice Patterns. Um, and I think it's interesting in affirming that, you know, when he talks about uh, how you should decompose your messages and how um, uh, messages should only be only have a few lines of code, if not just one. Um, you think about proportion, the proportionality of having uh, a class has a certain number of methods, um, and each one of those methods have a certain size, uh, and there's sort of this ideal that you try to move towards. Um, and, and then if you think about proportion in other ways, you want to have a similar amount of test code as you do implementation code. And there's kind of a balance that you're constantly aiming for and that these writings and patterns are pushing you towards um, reaching. Uh, and Ken Beck isn't going, I'm going to write a treatise on beauty. He's figuring out better ways of writing software. And he's codifying them in a set of patterns. And a lot of those patterns happen to be moving in the same direction as the basic principles of what make things beautiful. Um, so there's this feedback loop where his ideas are beauty fulfilling, right? Even though he wasn't necessarily thinking about beauty. Um, so, but if, so if we think about clarity, for example, Now think about proportion. Think about proportion. Um, you don't want something to be bigger than it needs to be to accomplish a given task. You want, you want it to be in the right proportion. Um, that's sort of another way of saying you want your language to be expressive enough so that you can, so that you can communicate things in a small amount of code. Um, but if you, if, if you go back to something like Assembler, I was talking to an Assembler programmer, and I was, talking, you know, I was telling about these sort of ideas of beauty that I was reading about. And he was saying that like back in the 70s, every week his team would have um, meetings where they would try to come up with better and better ways of writing assembly code and, and try to essentially come up with patterns. Um, but when you're working in an environment that's so constraining and what you can actually express, this code right here is adding numbers together. Um, so if you compare that to the way you would write that now, you would write that now like in one line. Or, and it would be because you, you have a, a primitive that maps very closely to the way that you think about it, whereas this is so verbose for just doing addition. But at the time, this was one of the most expressive ways of doing that, right? So if you're thinking about proportionality and expressi expressivity, and your basic guiding force is, is, it, is this the expected amount of work that I would have to do to, to reach this outcome, right? Am I doing too much to do something that's really simpler than, it, than all this code is? Uh, one of the sort of snafus of thinking that way is, well, you know, I'm writing an assembler. There's only so, there's only so much I can do to make it more expressive, right? Because we're just trying to map to kind of the real world. Uh, and we have to work within the, res the constraints we have. Um, so there's a relativity there, right? Perl, for example, is really famous for being really, really expressive. So in just a tiny amount of code, you can do whatever. Um, SHA-1 encryption in like three bytes or something. Um, and someone would say, damn, that's great proportion because I've barely written any code and I'm doing this really powerful thing. That's awesome. I've totally attained proportionality if you're thinking of things in terms of proportionality. Um, but there's a sort of checks and balances system with these three different rules. 
Because in Perl, you're getting tons of uh, expressivity, and you're reaching this great level of proportionality, but you're totally violating the clarity part. Right. Um, so there's an interesting relationship between these things because they end up balancing, balancing themselves up, out. Like the, um, right. So let's actually try to apply this, these three principles to some actual code um, and, uh, and see if it's helpful at all, right? So I was working on a library for the S3 service that Amazon has, simple storage service. And the, the way that that service works is you're basically making um, requests to them and they're returning huge XML payloads. And, um, and those payloads need to be transformed into object graphs. So in Ruby, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be taking, I'm parsing this XML and I'm gonna be transforming it into object graphs. And of course, since it's XML, it's all strings. It's a huge string. Um, but once I get to each one of these attributes, since I'm turning that stuff into an object graph, I want whatever is inside of that attribute to be the appropriate uh, class in Ruby. So here we have some examples. Some of that stuff is numeric. Some of that stuff is Boolean. Some of that stuff is uh, dates. And I wanted to be able to coerce all that stuff into the appropriate type. right? Um, so I was thinking about the problem. And uh, I came up with this idea of having a coercible string, right? So every time I got to the actual attribute of a given part of the XML, I would pass that string into a coercible string class that just had a coerce method. So if we take a look at the uh, implementation here, uh, I have this collection of coercions. And while there is another recursion, I mean, while there is another coercion available, I am grabbing that coercion and assigning it to attempt. And I'm going to do that until the coercion is not nil um, or there's no more coercions left, right? So either coercions.next is going to be false uh, or grabbing the next coercion is going to return anything. Um, so what's actually happening under the scenes is that I'm using the generator library, which is sort of like an iterator object. Um, this is basically how you do all iteration in Java, right, with iterators. Um, but this generator is basically um, exposing this block that calls a try method. Uh, and the try method on each successive try will check whether or not self, which is the string, um, is coercible to a certain type. So first we're gonna see if it's equal to true. So the result of this expression, if the string is true, will be Boolean true. In this case, the result of the expression will be true. And the reason why it's an array is because um, I want the actual result to be false, the value that it's coerced into. Then I try um, this integer method. And what happens in Ruby when you use integer with a string that can't be turned into an integer, let's say it has a letter in it, it'll raise an exception. And the same thing happens with date parse. So the actual implementation of try takes this generator object and yields the two values. So in this case, there's two. So it'll be, this will be true, and then it'll pass false. In this case, it'll be whatever the result of this expression is and then nil because it's only one thing that's being passed to the block. And then based on that value, I either yield it or, um, or if there's an exception raised, I yield nil, right? And so eventually, if attempt is nil, I just return self. Otherwise, I return attempt. So this is kind of a, like a pretty interesting different way of doing things. Um, and at the time, I was doing tons of Haskell, which is why I think I did it this way. Um, and uh, so when I did this code, I was pretty proud of myself. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, it turns out it violates every single rule of beauty. And if you show this to some people, they might look at it and go, wow, that's so over my head. Like, I can't even dream of a day when I'm going to be that good that I'll be able to write something that sophisticated. Um, but it's really bad, 
uh, actually. People would probably say, oh, that's beautiful. Some people would. Um, let's think about proportionality. This is what I actually ended up doing. So this is half as many lines. And what I'm doing is I'm taking some string representation of a potential other object and coercing it into that object. So I think about 10 lines, and we're including like end, 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 and depth in class. So really, six lines is, I think, pretty adequate for the fact that I'm trying for coercions. Um, 20 lines is out of proportion to what's needed to be accomplished. So it totally fails the proportion test. The integrity test. Hmm, this is kind of a trickier one. So the integrity is integrity is about being suited for the thing that you need to accomplish. Well, I implemented this other thing with the generator library. In Ruby 1.9, that's implemented with threads, but in Ruby 1.8, it's implemented with continuations. So it's slow, really slow. And the very thing that this is doing is it's taking huge XML payloads and it's calling this on every single attribute. Right? So when I changed to this implementation, my tests ran an order of magnitude faster. On top of it all, it leaked memory big time. Because I mean, that was kind of, that's a bug in the generator uh, library. But the fact that I was using generator library, which uses continuations, I deserved the memory leak. Right? <laughs> so when I actually, so I was running my test, and I was like, sweet, this library is awesome. It's beautiful. Ship it. And then someone sends me an email five days later, and they're like, my computer is beach balled because I'm out of memory. Because when you actually try to use this in the real world with a document that's larger than my test data, uh, it literally hoses your computer. And all it's doing is processing XML, you know? So major integrity problems here. It's not, it might be beautiful to some people, but it's not suited for the simple job that it needs to do. And not only is it not suited, but it fails big time. Um, so, clarity. The fact that I had to explain every line of this to you, <laughs> and then I showed you this and you all laughed. <laughs> so it clearly fails on clarity too. And in fact, when I was writing it, you know, I thought one of the reasons why I thought it was beautiful is because it, it seemed so declarative, you know, and it was so scalable from an API, uh, API perspective because I could just add another try block in here and it would try that one last, you know, if I had some new data type that I wanted to coerce it, through, coerce it to. Um, but there's all kinds of stupid magic going on. Like the fact that here, I thought it was elegant that the result of the expression was both valuable from a Boolean perspective because it communicated whether or not the coercion was successful, but it also was the value that you wanted, it, that you wanted the thing to be coerced to. But then that whole thing fails here, right, because this will be Boolean true, but I actually want it to be false. Um, and debugging that kind of stuff and writing tests, I didn't even understand how it worked while I was, you know, while I was actually implementing it. When I was done and it worked and the test passed, I was like, sweet, this is beautiful. But I struggled to even get the test to pass. So, you know, I think when you ask whether or not something is clear, first it has to be clear to the person developing it, right? So that's your first test. Can I even understand what's going on? Um, and if you can't say yes to that, then of course it isn't clear. Whether or not it's clear to someone else is a bit trickier. Yeah, you know, the other day I was working, um, Chad was working on his Facebook library that he's working on, and he showed me some code that, that um, was a total dry violation. And he already had an idea of how he was going to refactor it, but he was curious to see how I would refactor it. And so he showed it to me, and I basically told him how I'd refactor it. But the basics of how it worked is that um, there was four different kind of objects, uh, four different kind of classes that needed to be defined, and then the same kind of accessor, setter, setter, and getter method needed to be added. And the name of that method was basically the downcase version of the class or whatever. So we ended up coming up with some code where you had an array of symbols. You would iterate over each symbol, and the symbol was the name of the class. You would then call class new, passing it. Um, a block that would define the behavior you wanted on the class, which would then dynamically call define method using the name of the symbol to downcase it and then have the appropriate name for the method relative to the name of the class. 
And then all that result of class new would be passed to const set, which would then create the class that had the behavior that you wanted. Now, we, he and I looked at that code and we knew automatically what it was doing. Because we do that stuff all the time and we're accustomed to it. But if you showed that code to someone else, they might not understand. It might be obscure, like seriously obscure. Like some people don't even know that class.new exists. And furthermore, that you can pass a block to it to define behavior of the class that you're creating. So that code um, totally violated the clarity thing. But it was tricky because it didn't violate it for us. Right, so how do you how do you kind of draw the line? Um, that's kind of a you know the tricky question. So you know, the reason why I show you this code is that I can show you some huge ridiculous method that's like a hundred lines long, has tons of local variables, which clearly should be you know methods, and there's all this behavior and state that's not actually encapsulated the way it should be and decomposed. But um, no one is going to look at that and go, oh, that's beautiful. That's not very useful. This is something that I wrote and thought was beautiful. And I would imagine that other people would think it was beautiful too. Not necessarily everyone. Some people will look at this and go, that's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but you know, I think if we're actually talking about beauty and thinking about beauty and um, striving for beauty, um, Thinking about these three criteria, the idea of um, proportion and um, the idea of integrity and clarity, and I think is a nice little template to use to evaluate whether or not something is beautiful. And so, but why would you even write beautiful code? I mean, why would you strive for beauty? Why would you care? And I think it goes back to the idea of goodness is beauty in action. And the fact that all the stuff that I read um, from Kent Beck and all these people who have established ideas that people unassailably agree with, more or less, as being ways of writing better software, it's because they weren't planning on writing a treatise on beauty. They were discovering better ways of writing software. And it just so happens that all those ways of writing software better comply with the three rules of how to make something, or how to determine whether or not something is beautiful. So basically what I just wanted to provide was a template to think about uh, whether or not something is beautiful. And, um, and you know, in the last few weeks that I've been thinking about this stuff, I found it actually really useful to, when looking at code, think, you know, is that proportional to what it's intended to do? And uh, is it clear? And, these ideas of clarity and you know that stuff's not necessarily new, but if you think it, think of it in terms of the other two and see how they balance one another out, um, I, I think it ends up resulting in better software. And um, and I wouldn't claim that this is beautiful, um, but I think it's valuable that it doesn't violate any laws of beauty. That's it. Anyone want to talk about beauty? Any questions? Yeah, I wonder if you had any thoughts about the beauty of doing that as a subclass of string. In other words, making a subclass of string versus making it just a method of string or a method that processes a string. So why make this a subclass of string rather than just adding coerce to string? Yeah, or a method that or or, or code that just instead of self says string, right? It could be a method on another object or, you know. Right. I think if my only options were adding it to string mm -hmm. or creating some method that would, in functional style, pass a string, mm -hmm. I would choose the latter and not add it to string. But since I have the option of adding it to string, mm -hmm. that gives me sort of scalability in the API, where if for whatever reason, the requirements of this become more sophisticated. Um, it's more straightforward because I have the state that is the subject of what's being done available to me, whereas if I was using some functional style, it would be different. And of course, this is what you could say is, keep it simple, stupid. 
you start with the functional style, and as soon as the requirements become more sophisticated, switch to this style. And I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you. And, and you well, there's two, actually, there were two There are two stages there. One was the functional versus method. Yeah. The other is where the method lives, right? And there's other options there, right? You've chosen to actually subclass string yeah. and put the method there. Rather than the other options are to basically add it as a method of, of string, so all strings do this, right. or to add it to the in particular instance of string that you're coercing. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, the, the, the last point is interesting about adding it to the object itself right. just in time. And I've actually started to do that quite a bit, and people who care about performance hate that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess another way of answering your question is, if you think about the three ideas of beauty that I've presented, um, what would be the violation of one of those ideas that would motivate you to not do this? I think it brings up the point that a lot of times beauty is not about what you do, it's about what you don't do. It's not about, you know, how, what can I add on to make this prettier, it's about what, what can I trim away. You know, like the, the great sculptors talk about, the sculpture isn't about seeing what, what you want in the stone, it's about taking away the parts of the stone that don't matter, that, that aren't part of your sculpture, and then what you have left is the sculpture, and that's the beauty. Yeah, the, the comment that he made is that um, beauty sometimes is about what you take away, not what you add. Um, and in and in reading this stuff about beauty, I was having conversations with Chad, um, and and you know, of course, in talking about beauty in our conversations, we would start saying the word elegant. And I was like, where does elegance come into beauty? That's a can of worms. I don't think I want to even mention that word. You know, maybe I'll go do some elegance research on the side, a separate whole other can of worms. But it was interesting when we went and looked at the definition of elegance. It said stuff that you would expect, but then one of the words that it said was restraint that elegance was about restraint. And I think that's a pretty powerful and interesting idea. Um, and, you know, maybe next time we'll do a talk about elegance. We can talk about that. So, uh, seems to me to be a very postmodern language. And the postmodern notion of beauty is dominated by the concept of the sublime with uh, John Zockley, Atard, and those guys, where uh, you get your pleasure from some source of pain. Right. <laughs> and uh, this seems to be much more informed by the classic notion of yeah. beauty, which is structural and everything's ordered and, frankly, boring. Yeah. So you're, it sounds like you're selling a very... Right. This is a totally classicist approach to this totally classical notion of beauty. And, you know, in college, I studied critical theory and all that stuff. So I knew, lurking in the shadows, there was, there was more contemporary thought about beauty that completely violated all of these ideas. And um, it, this talk is intended to kind of be a pop talk on beauty. You know, this isn't a rigorous academic thing. So I didn't want to go into the minutia of you know, critical theory and postmodern thought and all those schools of stuff and bring that to bear and have this holistic notion of beauty. Um, because what really what I'm intending to do is try to, um, try to provide some way of thinking about how beauty relates to code in a way that might be useful, that it might help you to write better software. I have a friend who is she's getting a Master's of Fine Arts in Design. And she studied architecture at MIT. And, um, and she'll show me some work that she did. And I have this really classic, like I said, classical um, uh, obsession with symmetry. And so I'll go, oh, that's not, you know, I don't like it because it's unbalanced. Like it'd be nicer if it was symmetrical. And right now, she's reading all this critical theory, and so she always thinks that's ridiculous, because symmetry is stupid and boring and obvious and naive, right? So there's a lot of new thought that completely violates, like this, any professor that's under the age of 70 seeing this would think I was a joke. So, but it's, it's, of course, it's more complicated, right? But I don't know how useful postmodern ideas on beauty are for software, unless you're Larry Wall. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the, the reason it occurred to me to ask them is because I think the, the postmodern notion of beauty is what attracts a lot of people to Ruby, this sort of very uh, esoteric, wandering around in self-reference. And I, I think that that aesthetic right. of Ruby is what people find attractive. Right. The fact that Ruby is really reflective 
and all that kind of stuff and dynamic that I love about it probably has a lot of interesting corollaries with more recent theory. And I think I'm going to look into it in the next few months. Um, but I, and I might incorporate it into this, but I kind of think that's kind of a whole separate can of worms, right? right? But it's a good point that you bring up. Chad. I have a, a total guess. Right. <laughs> I mean, it kind of has to be symmetrical to be somewhat symmetrical to be a usable coffee cup. You know? Right. But here's, here's the idea is that um, there was the ideas about uh, the relationship of numbers and all this kind of stuff. And usually the first way that we think about all that stuff is spatially, right? Um, and so we think that's the genesis of all of these things. But the point of Plato and all the, these other people is that these properties apply whether or not you have a spatial representation of them, you know? And so when you're making a coffee cup, it's really reinforced that if you violate these rules, it's going to be a bad coffee cup. Um, but, but they apply to non-spatial things too, right? Th there's interesting ideas about how, I think, uh, originally, it was the Pythagoreans, they uh, looked at the world as a set of opposites. So you have even and odd numbers, you have love and hate, you have God and the devil, um, and they believed that one was perfection and the other one was wrong, and they wanted to eliminate it um, and elevate uh, the, the side that they thought was perfect. And then I think it was Heraclitus came and said, um, they're not, one isn't perfect and the other one isn't wrong, they're necessary to have in conflict with one another in balanced quantities, and it's the tension between the two of them that defines what symmetry is. So that was actually like what the definition of symmetry was, was a tension between these opposing sides. That related to the coffee cup somehow. <laughs> yeah, I think another kind of interesting thing about this is, of course, uh, you know, what exactly the code looks like doesn't, isn't that important if nobody goes back and looks at it again. So having it, you know, uh, beautiful is important in that respect. One of my coworkers likes to say you should code like the person maintaining your code is a homicidal maniac who knows where you live. Right. <laughs> right. But the thing about the thing about code looking beautiful, if you think about those three criteria, um, they're not really about whether or not it looks beautiful. They're about the quality right. of the code. Um, so my case statement doesn't look beautiful. But it doesn't violate laws of beauty, so there's a weird paradox to go home with. But um, the fact that it doesn't violate those properties potentially. But I think the important point is the important point is if it's beautiful to you, that's great. And there's and I read all this stuff about how beauty is really from the point of view of the perceiver and all this kind of stuff. It's not in the object itself. But if we couch all that stuff, um, the important thing is that you're not violating the laws of beauty. Whether or not it's beautiful, whatever. Question. There. Are there any um, projects uh, that you would recommend reading as examples, good examples of beautiful code? Mm. It's political. Both modern stuff, read wide. Oh, yeah. So. There's a book called Beautiful Code <laughs> that was um, published by O'Reilly like three weeks ago or something. And so in the last few weeks, people have gone, oh, you're doing a talk on beauty. Have you read this book? I actually haven't read the book. I looked at the code in the book. Um, I, I looked at the code, and I didn't read any of the actual essays in the book. And I'm thinking I should, because someone told me the essays are pretty interesting, and you know they might be pertinent to all the stuff you're um, talking about. I looked at the code, and this is where I get politically incorrect, and I didn't really think any of it was beautiful. But I didn't uh, analyze it according to the criteria of beauty because I hadn't arrived at those criteria yet. So maybe if I reevaluate them, they might not be beautiful, but they might not violate any of the rules of beauty. What's not ugly. Right, and I think that's valuable. Right. Um, so yes. to the original question, are there, is there any code that I would think is beautiful. I'm really trying to think of code that I didn't write. 
to tell you. <laughs> Which isn't to say that I think everything I've written is beautiful. Um, but actually, you know, I haven't spent a lot, enough time with these ideas to actually go back and evaluate stuff according to the three principles. Um, so it might be that code that I think is beautiful now is really just a coercible string that uses continuations in a generator. So um, I think there are parts of Rails that are beautiful. Uh, ish. Um, I think, well, I think there are people who write beautiful code. I think Jeremy Kemper writes beautiful code. I think Jameis Buck writes awesome code, which is often beautiful. Um, oh, okay. The Rails thing brings up a weird thing because one of the things I think people find a lot in Rails is that the Rails code itself might be um, bordering on hideous, but it can enable other people to write beautiful code. And so you can build this bulwark of kind of an ugly foundation. And not saying that Rails is necessarily an ugly foundation, but there are pieces where you go, I'm really kind of upset right. that you did that. However, I'm going to go ahead and use that and act like it's But the there. API it exposes allows you to write stuff that people think is beautiful. Right. So your foundation or framing might be ugly, but it's well hidden by this, you know, filigree plaster work or whatever. Right. right. I mean, according to the literature on beauty, that means that it's really not beautiful, I guess. But yeah, that's um. That's political, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's an. It's famous for building beautiful houses that had very bad functional problems. Oh. Okay. <laughs> You could apply this at a, at a lar on a larger scale rather than you know, looking at 120 lines of code, look at a Java app with thousands of lines and the corresponding right. Ruby app and or, or Rails app. And we're, we're here because most we think that the Rails app is, is more beautiful. And it's then, then the question is, you know, why is some, you know, and perhaps there are, a lot of, there are a lot of conflicting and balancing principles in software development. You want encapsulation and, and you want safety of different kinds. and Maybe some of those principles were pursued too too energetically in Java, right. and, and it's, there's a lot of corrupt as a result. Right, but if you think about that scenario, I, I think you're, to your original point, I think it's valuable and interesting that if, if that these three criteria work at all sort of levels of practical granularity, yeah. um, and specifically if you compare like a 50,000 line Java configuration file with uh, <laughs> a 5,000 line Rails application. You could say when it comes to proportion, of course, this is this is way better. But because of the sort of checks and balances of the of the criteria, you would then think about integrity. Like, does this Rails app actually do what it's intended to do relative to the Java app? And the answer might be yes, in which case more points for no beauty violations. Um, but if it doesn't, then I, I think that's where some of the value of, of having the checks and balances come in, because there's all kinds of stuff that satisfy proportion but, but violate clarity and uh, Etc. So it's a good point that this works at sort of all levels of, of whether you're looking at one line of code, one expression, or a method, or a class, or a project, or a community. So um, one thing I encountered when I started writing in Ruby was that I was constantly questioning whether I was writing <coughs> in a Ruby idiomatic way, like whether or not my Ruby code was Ruby code, or was it really Java code that I was writing in Ruby. And uh, how does that relate to your concept of beauty? Well, so the question is, he was saying that when he started writing Ruby, he kept on um, being concerned with the idea of writing Ruby in an idiomatic way. He was worried that he was writing things in a Java-ish way. And uh, how does idiomatic Ruby relate to the, the beauty idea? Well, if we think about, um, if I know Ruby really well, um, you might be doing something. I was telling someone the example earlier. I had a friend who was working on something that involved columns and rows. And so there was arrays of arrays. And he wanted to take a column and translate it into a row. And he sent me an email with some code in it. And he was using inject. And he said, can you think of a better way of doing this? And I looked at it. And I was like, that's the best way I think you could do it with inject. Um, but then I was like, but you could use transpose, which is a method that does it for you. It's already built into the library. So there are more idiomatic ways of doing things in Ruby because they are more proportional or because you know they are clearer. Um, and so I think idiomatic Ruby is very much related to, it almost translates directly to, does it violate any of these rules of beauty? Beauty is also always cultural. When the Eastern and Western cultures first encountered each other, they each found their other person's art mutually 
yeah. impulsive. And it took a long time for each culture to realize that the other culture's art was could be beautiful, but you had to rethink beauty itself and what the whole thing was. And so if you're transi- transitioning from one cultural programming language to another one, then it's going to take a long time for your idea of beauty to it itself yeah. adjust. And you can't just automatically adopt the idioms. And in the same way, if there was any university professor under the age of 70 watching this talk, they would go, Plato, Aquinas? Like, this is totally occidental and hegemonic and colonizing, and where are the actual, like, oriental ideas of beauty or Middle Eastern ideas of beauty? And so, yeah, of course. Like, this is totally a white man's (laughs) version of beauty. Um, And so, points well taken. There are, there's all kinds of notions of subjectivity and beauty, and then there's subjectivity about whether you think subjectivity is the determiner of beauty. Um, So, yeah, this is by no means uh, rigorous. I guess I wanted to share something. I don't know how many of you guys have read uh, um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, but uh, Piercy goes through a discussion of beauty and quality and, and so forth. And one of the things that he comes up against is there is this sort of classical beauty, which engineers appreciate that something is structurally sound and functional. There is a romantic beauty, which is sort of your perception of the thing and the surface gloss and how it makes you feel and so forth. And his his thesis is that there is an essential quality that generates all of these things. And when I was thinking about this talk in relation to that, what I I enjoy about Ruby uh, that I have not enjoyed about C++ um, is that the essential quality of whatever um, function I'm writing, method I'm writing, uh, is the idea that it represents. And Ruby gets you closer to that idea than the um, other methods we have of expressing those things. So that there's a structural a structural beauty to well-written assembly code. And there's a surface appearance of, of beauty. Things are laid out correctly or so forth. But I think that the essential quality um, that generates a feel, you know, generates that that quality sense about code that, that we're all looking for, maybe how closely we're relating the, the mental concept that we have to the implementation of it. So that that was just coming up for me as something that um, it's it's parallel to I think the three the three tenets, but integrated with on sort of what we're trying to aim towards. I think that I mean I think basically what you gave is a explanation of what Matz is talking about when he talks about programmer joy. Um, because you're taking this sort of idea and um, and you're sort of you're sort of transforming it into something real, right? And there's stuff I read like by Plato about inspired poets and he thought poets were losers. Um, but he thought inspired poets were slightly more redeemable because they did what you're talking about. And it was their job to um, sort of translate these things and make them experienceable by, you know, so I don't remember the details, but yeah, I think that's totally, I think that's why I write software. I'm glad you said that. How are enduring qualities of uh, beauty? Because um, you know, in, in just observing certain things like cars, for example, certain cars like a Ferrari made in 1960s still looks beautiful today. Oldsmobile doesn't. Or, or, so do, does that apply here too? You think is that something that's also discussed? In? This question was about enduring beauty, and, and if you think, if you look, if he was saying like if you look at a Ferrari from the '60s or '70s, and you look at a Oldsmobile, right? Like one's beautiful, and what isn't it? It's remained beautiful across cultural things. Beauty yeah, beauty versus fashion. There's all this literature on aesthetics that I totally haven't gotten to yet. Um, I, you know, my guess, if I just gave you a little back of the envelope thing is that that Ferrari doesn't violate those rules. Um, and so your initial appearance of the Oldsmobile back then is like, oh, this is nice. In the same way, my initial, uh, the initial appearance of the generator thing was nice, um, but that it ultimately violates things. And over time, um, those violations, there's a, a patina that uh, the thing gets, and then you start seeing the cracks. Interesting. I'm thinking about how perhaps the programming language might affect what's beautiful, right? And uh, you know, really, you, when you program, you're sort of programming under a set of constraints that are imposed by the programming language. Like right? assembly. So it got me thinking about. I don't know how many people have read Doug Hofstadter's book, Le Tome Beau de Maro. Uh, Doug, who wrote Lecture Bakke. It's a book all about. Yep. Well, I wouldn't say all about because it kind of ties two things together, but the ostensible theme of the book is 
what happens when you try to translate uh, literature, poetry, uh, or, and other forms of literature that is written under a constraint? Like, imagine trying to, to translate Gödel Escher Bach into yeah. French or German, yeah. right? And what has to stay the same and what has to change, right? I think there's probably, I'm going to go back and reread that now because I think there's some interesting ideas there about this and how beauty relates to programming languages. Yeah, that's good. And there's a French guy, Georges Perec, who I think the most common letter in French is letter A. So he wrote a book with yeah. no letter A. That was one of the, I think that was one of the, book, one of the things that he talked, that uh, Oscar oh, talked about. He says, now, if you translated that book into English, yeah, well, how someone did. Yeah. Someone translated it into English, and but they, they removed the letter E. Yeah. 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 <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. I think that violates all of the rules of you. <laughs> what I think that does is it, it, it's like the whole theory of constraints and how constraints actually enable your creativity. And... Hofstetter has this theory in that book called the rickety bridge theory, which is that you know when you first are building this bridge under these constraints, it's really difficult to cross the chasm there, but um, the, there are these inspired leaps that your brain starts to make, and you, you come up with these amazingly beautiful things. you know, And the constraints are what kind of produces that. Well, in a certain way, those three criteria are a set of constraints. Because if you didn't have the three criteria constraints, you would do coercible string and be satisfied with it with the generator. So, yeah, I don't think I think people can. You know, if you agree with the idea of constraints, I don't think that goes against the idea of having. They, they are in fact constraints. I think it also relates to things like why why good movies are are, are literally you know literal adaptations of a book, right? Because there's different constraints in movie making than in writing a novel. Yeah. Um, um, kind of tying what I was talking about with your, I'm, I'm thrilled you're talking about this. Um, you know, when, when uh, Kent put together those those patterns, uh, it was through years of being inspired by, well, patterns come from Christopher Alexander, which comes from architecture, which, yeah. and Alexander looked at all these other things. Uh, if you want to really get into beauty and read his stuff, yeah, I'll stretch your mind too. Um, what Kent was trying to do is say, okay, I see these great concepts and I'm writing code, how do I put it together? And he spent years gathering those things out, and unfortunately he came out right as the chasm was right. we were going into it. <laughs> but um, you know, the, the key thing was, and I told a lot of people, read that book, you know, when they were reading Java or whatever, and some of it translates pretty well, some of it doesn't, because I think you know, what Rick was well, talking and, about. And that's sort of why but, I brought that up. Yeah. So anyway, so actually it's a long way of saying, uh, are you sensing a need to write a Ruby best practices Patterns book or because you know I mean I, that's a big concern of mine. I look at you know some of the stuff that's out there and it's just okay I, you know new people in there. How do I show them what the best code is, right? You know I think I can hand them I can have Kent's book and it's like, great. This is written in small talk. <laughs> yeah, I think um, along those same lines, um, I was going to ask if you'd actually heard about this. Uh, uh, there's a blog post written recently where he talks about how like design patterns are actually a sign of weaknesses in your language. And um, since right, like a lot of the stuff in the Gang of Four book, you don't need in Ruby because you either get it for free or you know, you only need like two of those patterns. Yeah, so how, relate, so, so how would you relate small talk to So how would you relate that to uh, to what you're talking about since you've touched heavily on the design patterns? Well, the, to your original question, like do you think that <laughs> there should be a book on best practice patterns in Ruby? Um, you know, I think that's kind of an inevitable thing, but I think people are still in the gestation period where um, in the same way that Kent Beck was working on real projects and small talk for years and running up against better and worse ways of doing things and reaching a point where they finally crystallized, I think there's that Ruby is still in a period where um, a lot of people are talking about beauty and thinking about how to make things beautiful and actually building apps now in Ruby as opposed to just knowing that it's some hypothetical language that exists. And so I don't think, I don't think yet that um, there's been enough time to let it marinate, but I think it's getting close. And I think there are people who do have a pretty strong sense of how Ruby, how, what are better and worse ways of doing Ruby. But, on that, um, there was a book called Small Talk with Style that came out probably, what, four or five years before the best practice patterns? And uh, that was kind of the first attempt. You know, it was kind of like 1.0 of best practice patterns, and it was 
It's like Python. Yeah, so um, you know, I, I think it would be worth an attempt to, to gather this together. It wouldn't be me because I don't program enough in it. But that, that's why I was trying to encourage you maybe or somebody else. <laughs> or somebody else out there who has done enough of it now to say, okay, I think I can start assembling this stuff and, and I, mean, yeah. I won't reach perfection. Man, give me something better than having yeah, to figure I, out. I actually, I actually talked to Ken about doing movie best practice. I said he was thinking about doing it, but there wasn't any money in books anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one of the, the difficult parts with Ruby, and I, I come from a Java background, yeah. is yeah. that there's so many different ways of doing things. In Java, you're pretty constrained to what you can do. You've got interfaces, you've got classes, you know, and the statics. In, in Ruby, I can do things so many different ways. I can do singletons, I can, you know, do metaprogramming, and finding out exactly where that sweet spot is for those different ways of doing things can be rather daunting, particularly for someone, you know, new to the language. And, and that's where I see that kind of... Right. It can be a way <laughs> I think, and I think Ruby yeah. sort of lies right in between Perl and Python in the whole. There's more than one way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, like in Perl, there's more than one way to do it, and the string like zero is boolean true or boolean false. So like, there's more than one way to do it. Applies on all kinds of levels of granularity, and some have pervasive implications to the software that gets written. Uh, like, I think that kind of more than one way to do it, like, there's more than one way to do Booleans, uh, yeah. is the wrong kind of, there's more than one way to do it. On the other hand, with Python, um, I think frameworks should impose opinions, not languages. So framework builders can do whatever they want, um, and then they present their Guido opinions to the world through their framework. But when the language constrains you to only Guido's way of doing things, um, so, I think that yes, there are more. There is more than one way to do things in Ruby, um, but I, I think that it's a, a nice balance between sort of insanity and PC World Magazine editor. <laughs> well, I don't think it's a bad thing. I just think it's you know it's, it's, it makes things chaotic. Yeah, it, it can. So when someone's coming from from you know other languages that don't have those capabilities, I also think that. For better or worse, the answer to the kind of question, the form of question you're posing, is solid, right? Which you know, that, that it's sort of like patterns at different levels, uh, right. right? A lot of people think of patterns as you will do it this way, right? Whereas if you look at the well-written patterns, they're all couched in terms of here's a problem, here's some aspects, that, you know, features that you may have when you're trying to solve a problem like this. Here are indications that you should use this pattern. Here are indications that you shouldn't, right? Or maybe you could. So it's not quite, you know, I remember way back in the old days, PL1, talking about old programming wow. The initial implementation of PL1 had horrible subroutine linkage performance. And people were writing, said, never call subroutines in PL1. Now, that's an awful thing to do. Right? <laughs> I like fixed it, but then there was a lot of people who lived on never writing, you know, writing lots of, you know, straight line code, right? So, for teams to sit here. so a lot of it is figuring out how to think about it, right? Sure. I, I kind of like the perspective of what you did for a while. You went back and forth and, you know, striving for beauty and then striving to just simply avoid the ugly. And that, that looking at the negative side of it is, is helpful. You're, uh, it ends up, I guess, you know, avoid code that's not clear, uh, avoid loaded code, and and uh, avoid broken code that doesn't do what you want. And that would be sort of the negative way of looking at this. And then there are the anti going, but going to the pattern uh, perspective, there are the anti patterns which are coming out are. As has been mentioned, patterns are often just ways to avoid problems, to deal with problems. A lot of those problems go away for you in Ruby. In any language, you still encounter problems. And so focusing on you know, avoiding those, you know, the, the negative, avoid the ugly, is maybe a, a, another practical way to get at it. That's a good point. Another take on patterns, perhaps, is that if a language is truly as expressive as, say, English, which is sort of what Bonds was shooting for, <coughs> at least as I understand it, then there are so many different ways, as, as I guess has already been said, to say the same thing. So who's to say this is the right way to say it? 
it's all a matter of exactly what you're trying to say and speaking your mind in terms of code. Yeah, but again, I think patterns, can you think of patterns as kind of a guidebook rather than a prescription? Sure. I mean, think again about Alexander and architecture. It's I mean, like, how many like different ways are there to design doors and windows and where to put them and whatnot? It's really just a question of if you're facing this situation, you know, uh, here's, what, here's the things you should think about in trying to choose how to do that, right? It's like the, the My Decision website, right? It's really building up a set of, it's building up a filter about how you think about making this, making coding and design decisions. Uh, going on that, uh, instead of maybe writing beautiful code book or best practice patterns, how about avoiding the ugly? You know, the, uh, and, and I mean, you know, I've been hearing recently, somebody's made a statement that I heard that, you know, negative law is actually providing more freedom than positive law. Right, negative law, you know, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal. Anything else besides those, you know, basic things, you're free to do. It's when you say, oh, at three o'clock you must do this, at two o'clock you must do this, and you know, that's when you don't have freedom anymore. So if you guys are, um, if you guys are, if you guys are interested in beauty um, and these ideas, you should come play werewolf. <laughs> Where? Ten. I want to sort of wrap up your talk. <laughs> <laughs> I grant you that. Only because the, the discussion is so abstract because this is such an interesting topic to software developers who are passionate, right? And we start talking about like what is beauty and can this classical definition work, et cetera, et cetera. I think we can actually take proportion, integrity, and clarity and apply it to this methodology or method that you've just given us. Because that's what this is. This is not an abstract discussion of beauty and code. This is actually taking an abstract thought, turning it into three things that you can run all of your code through. Even if those don't define beauty, who cares, right? They define something good. And, and so if we take this method and run it through there, proportionally, I think we're doing well because we actually do have a small classical definition of beauty that we've just said, okay, this is small. Everyone can understand it, too. It's clear. We all understand P, I, C, you know? So the one thing we need to test, then, is integrity. And I think, so far, having talked to Marcel about this before the conference and run my own code through this, the refactoring example that he came up with from my Facebook library, I actually hadn't gone back and considered that that might not be beautiful code because we both actually arrived at the same conclusion separately of doing all this class.new beautiful metaprogramming, elegant metaprogramming, so I thought, you know. But, but after we started talking about this, I started reading back through my code, and I thought, hmm. You know, that was the first thing that came to mind. But like when I showed this to Rich Kilmer, who is one of the best Ruby programmers alive, he said, ooh, I didn't know you could do that, you know, to one of the things. He actually didn't know what the code did. <laughs> so it wasn't clear, and I said, oh, Marcel, look at this. We we're talking about this beauty stuff. Look at this piece of code that we thought was awesome a couple of days ago. And now let's apply proportion, integrity, clarity. It passed proportion and integrity, fine. But clarity, it was like, is there a clearer way to do this? And it turns out we, I could have just created a module and mixed it in. It would have been really simple. Everyone would have understood it. So I think this is passing that test. Like, it is passing itself, you know? And I think it's worth us all going back and taking this and trying to run our own code through it and see what happens, maybe start a discussion about it. But it may be a way for us as developers to think about our own code, even if we think we're hotshot badasses, you know? So anyway. That's exactly what I wanted to say. <laughs> Are we out of time? Or? Yeah. We're out of time. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks.